Laura Schwendinger. I'm a composer of art music. I write chamber works. I write orchestral works and I've worked on a couple of operas in the last number of years. Um, Artemisia and a new one coming out March 5th and 6th called Cabaret of Shadows uh, which will be done by Musica in Houston, Texas. Um, so today what I want to do is I want to share a few things with you. I want to um, share some of my chamber music, some of my orchestral music, and some of that opera. Uh, there are various um, approaches that I have taken over the years. I'm very much interested in art, and I'm interested in nature, and my music has been g built upon these ideas and these interests of mine. Uh, before I really get into it and share some excerpts of my music with you, I want to thank Tanya Leon for asking me to take part in, in this impact series and um, and thank her for the interest. I'm really honored to be asked. Um, okay, so in the first group of excerpts I'm going to share for you today, I'm going to um, talk a little bit about my chamber music. And um, I'm going to start with the work that kind of got me going in a specific direction towards um, the meeting of plastic arts and music. And um, the other thing I should tell you is I'm an artist as well. I paint in oils, I do ceramics, I build sculptures, um, I threw pottery at a very young age until um, basically I became professional at it in high school and um, bought a couple of instruments and a flutist with that money. Um, so um, art for me is just something in my lifeblood. I go to museums when I'm visiting um, places abroad. Um, that's the very first thing I do. I go to um, contemporary art museums and um, I, 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 I practically, when I visit Paris, practically live at the Louvre and um, Musée d'Orsay and Cluny. Um, so th this is just really part of who I am. And um, the first piece I want to share with you today is a piece called High Wire Act. So, High Wire Act was written for Bright Music, and it is featuring um, Christina Jennings. The idea behind the work was to talk about Alexander Calder's wire circus figures. They're very beautiful to me, and I love mobiles, and I love Calder's work in general. So, um, I, I made these little character portraits of various apparatus that go into high wire acts. So the first of those is um, the aerialists. And in this movement, we hear the flute and the viola play a, a soaring love duet high above the nets um, in the circus. And um, they're kind of connecting with each other and there is this veil of sound that's underneath them. And of course, it was written for Christina Jennings and her husband, Matt, who are incredible musicians, and since they're married, I thought it would be a lovely love song for them. The fourth movement is called um, Bird Under a Tent, and um, this bird is stuck under the circus tent. It happened to me when I was a little girl. I was at the Barnum & Bailey Circus, and I saw this bird getting stuck under the circus tent, and I wondered about whether it would survive, and it was very hard for me to enjoy the circus because of this experience. And being a flutist, I thought this would be a chance for me to write a really virtuoso flute solo where the flute is trying to get out. And then the final movement that we're going to hear, and each one of these movements is very short, um, is the, the, the final troupe finale where everybody tries to get together and then finally they get one last little flash of a real two. Without further ado, this is movements three, four, five of my high wire acts for flute violin, viola, cello, and piano.
was High Wire Act. Um, that is available, by the way, on Centaur recording called High Wire Acts with other works of mine, other chamber works of mine. So I hope you enjoyed that. Now I'm going to go on to another chamber work of mine. Um, it is a, a, a piece for solo piano called um, Van Gogh Nocturnes, and it continues on the interest of art and how art intersects with music. And um, uh, it is being played by my very dear colleague, Chris Taylor. So from the Van Gogh Nocturnes, we're going to hear Night Café Varl. It is the second movement of three short movements. And it is a, a, a reverie on the life I imagine Van Gogh might have lived. Um, we hear a little Parisian style musette to start with. Then we hear the music kind of taking off. And I imagine Van Gogh drinking too much absinthe might lose a little bit of control, and so the music does that as well. So now I'm going to share just a little bit from a piece called Creature Quartet that was written for the Jack Quartet. It's about 
endangered mythological and um, extinct creatures. And um, it kind of mirrors my feeling about the end of species being a very, very sad and moving moment for us. Yeah. And um, this quartet is, is kind of an ode to these creatures, um, a way to awaken people to uh, at least how I feel about them. So the first excerpt I'm going to play from the Creature Quartet is the Tasmanian t Devil. And you might have seen the Tasmanian Devil in films, video, or if you've gone to Australia, maybe you've seen them in the zoo there. They are fierce little creatures. Um, they make this incredibly scary sound. And of course, Looney Tunes turned them into a cartoon character. I'm showing that tenaciousness in this little excerpt that I'm going to play from the Quartet However, they're really adorable little animals, so it's not quite fair of me. of the string instruments and it approximates the actual sound that the Tasmanian double makes. Oh, that, that really is a good approximation of what they sound like. Um, now I think I'm going to move on to my orchestral music because I want to share some of my opera with you as well and we don't have a lot of time together. A couple of so. short excerpts from orchestral pieces. I found myself about um, 12 years ago writing three large pieces for solo instrument and orchestra in a row. And we recorded that for Albany Records with Nicole Paymont conducting. This is the way the cello concerto opens. The cello concerto espremere, which means to breathe. And um, the cello concerto really is about the breadth of the cello, the, the very very depths of the sound of the lower register going all the way up to the singing qualities of the A string. <laughs>
that is from the first movement of the cello concerto. Now I'm going to share a little bit of the opening of the second movement of the cello concerto. So you can see I'm using the full range of the cello and letting them be incredibly virtuosic. That particular piece means a lot to me and I'm, I'm glad to be able to share it with you today. Now you might have noticed that my music is, is varied, <laughs> that it's very dramatic or it's very sweet. My, my approach is really to be as all-inclusive as I can possibly be. And so I call myself a maximalist. And um, it's not the maximalism that we've heard of from the past, it's my own maximalism. But it just means that I don't ever deny myself some approach that might actually express what I'm thinking about. This also gives me a chance to talk a little bit about my approach in terms of how I compose. I, I tend to think linearly. I'm a flutist, I was a singer. And um, so what I do is I, I compose a lot of counterpoint sometimes more. I mean the cello concerto in one of the movements I had 10 part counterpoint and then I remove the things that are non-essential and I try to feature those things that I think are important to use but if I need more density or if I need more activity I will go to the larger areas of counterpuntal layout. So a little bit like overkill but it, it's easier for me to kind of whittle away what's non-essential than it is just to things that I think feel essentially non-essential if I, if I work in that methodology. So this is the way that I work. The next thing I'm going to play for you um, is a little bit of my violin concerto, which was commissioned by Miller Theatre for Jennifer Coe. So this is a little bit of the second movement, just the very opening of the second movement of my violin concerto, Chiaro Scuro Azzurro, which is about this idea of light and dark, heavy contrasts, strong contrasts, and then the azzurro, because it's a little bit blue, the, the overall feeling of the piece is a little sad. You will hear a beautiful little melody to start, very, very quiet, very different than the cello concerto excerpt that we just listened to, and then the group comments on that violin solo.
Um, the last thing I want to share with you today is a little bit about my opera, Art Artemisia. It's about Artemisia Gentileschi, who was a famous Baroque painter in her time. She painted at the same time that Caravaggio painted, and she was part of the same movement as Caravaggio's movement, um, and um, light and dark. And so as I was um, working on um, various pieces that had to do with art, I got to know some famous woman painters' works. And she was one of the, the female artists that I got to know. But her story is so compelling that I really wanted to do something with it. So um, what I did was I wrote, wrote an opera. I used her various canvases as um, the jumping off point, And those canvases act as tableau vivant, where something is acted out as it was in the canvas. And um, uh, those famous canvases kind of outline the arc of her life. And we know from her letters um, that she wrote to one of her patrons, Don Ruffo, that she was suffering from something and she needed money for a procedure. And um, my wonderful librettist, Jen Strand, um, decided to uh, surmise that what she needed was cataract surgery, that she was losing her eyesight. It's not a difficult thing to imagine because um, that surgery was very popular that during that time and a lot of people died just from infection. The thing about Artemisia Gentile, she was a great artist, but for many years, she was not really um, considered one of the best artists. And the reason why was because of sexism, <laughs> but also because early on in her life, she was raped by her one of her art tutors, um, Augustine Tassi. And that, that trial, that subsequent rape trial, kind of overtook knowledge of her. And so that when people thought of her, they thought of her as the artist whose um, rapist was put on trial. The amazing thing is, is that he was found guilty at the end of the trial, which was pretty extraordinary. And during the trial, Artemisia was tortured with thumbscrews to, to um, make her case thumbscrew them and do and break fingers. That is not something that is um, at all just, that it, this is what happened to Artemisia. So the story is really a bold one. It is a dramatic one. It is, her life story is really the perfect stuff of opera. It was produced six different times in the last two years by Trinity Wall Street in an orchestral version, by CCO in a piano reduction, and by the Left Coast Chamber Ensemble in San Francisco, a marvelous group, um, in a chamber music version at um, Z Space. And I want to share with you today a couple of short excerpts, the first of which is Self Allegory of Art. And this is a canvas in which she paints herself as the artist. And you see her with her hand and the paintbrush and the canvas. And um, it, it's a marvelous thing to see this woman in action. And that's the self-portrait really tells us what she thinks is important about who she is. So we're going to be able to see a little bit of the Trinity Wall Street production.
have been blessed six times and you still like an extra load. A specialist is what you need. I know an
Yes, <laughs> 